needs and then training. And in the afternoon, we're going to have a, a slight division of the program. The lab working group members are going to be convened here to discuss the work plan of the year to come. So for people online, there may be no need to connect unless you're interested in hearing that. Uh, and then there is a breakout session with everyone. Uh, so an exercise working on minimum standards for lab capacity. Uh, again, for those online, it may be interesting to join towards the end of the exercise when uh, the different groups will come in and report on um, the different points that they have discussed during that session. So probably around 4.30. And then we will follow with the closing of the lab working group meeting. All right. Uh, so again, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for those who have been here for four days, four whole days, and the ones of you who, have, who have arrived and started yesterday. Uh, hopefully we still have a lot of energy uh, to talk about capacity and competency. All right. So again, today is all about capacity and competency. And when we look at if we grossly summarize the roadmap with regards to the lab pillar, uh, it's all about strengthening cholera laboratories and laboratory surveillance, right? Uh, it's written in different ways in the roadmap. And uh, so capacity and competency is at the core of this. And while we're gonna be looking throughout the day at ways that the laboratory working group can continue to support strengthening of the laboratories, <laughs> we also have a couple of activities that have started quite some time ago, but this week is the official second kickoff of these activities. One is about setting the reference, right? Thinking about minimum standards for lab capacity. What are we aiming towards? And the other one is how do we assess, evaluate lab capacity and competency? And this will also help us, you know, monitor progress of any interventions that we um, put in place. So a few words, I'm gonna, this is gonna be short, but I think it's important to keep in mind throughout the day. Minimum capacity standards for cholera laboratories. What do we mean about that? What will be the final product? So we're thinking this will be official new guidance from the laboratory working group where minimum standards uh, will describe the least permissible condition required to demonstrate a basic level of performance, right? This could be considered as our first target or at least one of our targets as a laboratory pillar for overall strengthening of the cholera lab capacity. And we need to make sure that what is written in the minimum standards is aligned with every other uh, guidance that we put out there or it already exists. So some key considerations for this activity. Again, going back to how it has to be aligned with all current and future recommendations of the GTFCC. Well, for example, in the surveillance guidelines that were published uh, a few weeks ago, we have stated in there uh, in a section called lab capacity that there should be at least one laboratory in country that is capable of identifying vibrio toxigenic vibrio cholerate O1, O139 through culture or PCR and performing ASTs, antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So this very much sounds like a minimum standard. This is one of the examples. Um, the standards should be described for all components of the laboratory system. So going from sample collection, transport, all the way up to reporting of results and also including supplies and storage, et cetera. We should describe minimum standards at least at regional and central level, maybe more. And then a big consideration is, and this is what we want to hear from you today, is how minimal is minimal, right? Is one, going back to that example, is one laboratory in country that is capable of doing the things that I've said before. So identifying through culture or PCR, toxigenic VCO1 and performing ASTs at central reference level, is that enough? Should we be satisfied with that as a minimum standard? 
or as we've heard, many countries here present with us are working towards strengthening the regional capacity and labs are being capacitated in the regions with at least the very first stages of culture. Maybe that does not include seroglutination for now because that is hard to access. The supplies are hard to access for that. Should that be a minimum standard? You know, this is for you to tell us, keeping in mind that this will be our one of our first targets. So the next steps, again, today, we're consulting with you and the laboratory working group, the countries and partners to get a sense of what these minimum standards should be. Where do we set that threshold? And we uh, are very happy to have a consultant with us. So this will be CDC funded project for six months uh, and he will be in charge of finalizing the guidance, uh, this guidance. And we're not so hard as to make him present on his first week of joining the team. So that's why I'm here talking about this. The second topic was the cholera lab capacity assessment. So how do we evaluate capacity and competency? <laughs> first of all, um, let me tell you about an exercise that is still ongoing that happened this year. So a few months ago, when we beefed up our response at WHO in response to the, the global context, right? The global crisis. Uh, there was creation of an incident management team and the laboratory pillar of the incident management team, whether it's at global level, regional level, country level, the first questions that we asked ourselves obviously were, what are the needs? Where do, what can we do to help in, in this context of crisis right now? And there are things that are obvious and others that are not. And where do you put the few resources that you have? So we tried to and started a rapid uh, cholera laboratory assessment. It was a list of not quite 30 questions that were you know, drafted with the, our regional representatives and were shared with countries. I will say so far that the quick part, not so quick, but we are getting some responses and that is helping us um, fill those gaps. A few of the results of this exercise will be described by uh, some of our colleagues and the next speakers, or at least initial results. So within the GTFCC laboratory group now, what we're proposing, what we're going to do, what Pascal is gonna do, is to continue to work on creating a DTFCC lab working group toolkit. So that includes a detailed questionnaire, user guide, checklists, et cetera, uh, to assess and map currently available capacity. Uh, an important consideration, we know that laboratories, they're always bombarded with assessments, right? There's an assessment for uh, gastrointestinal diseases, one for just general labs, there's the accreditation processes, there, there are many other different activities out there. So we want to make sure that we align with those, we avoid too much duplication, too much burden and effort on the side of the laboratories. And we also have to think, um, and we're going to be talking about this with the lab working group members this afternoon, about what are the, our clear objectives on this exercise. It's not actually just about mapping gaps and needs or mapping capacity. We want to be able to, for example, place that data together with the PAMI data. And, you know, again, as Marie-Law was presenting yesterday, part of the roadmap uh, states that the multi-sectoral interventions should be targeted. So you know, one of the sectors is lab. How do you target lab intervention specifically with regards to the PAMIs? If we have a PAMI in X country, in this country, what are the interventions on the lab side that will have most impact? Where should we first place our resources? So the comparison of this data should be able to inform us there. And then there are other, obviously many other benefits, including, uh, searching for funds, right? Resource searching and both from our end, the GTFCC and countries directly, they could use the products here. Uh, advocacy, 
uh, there are different objectives. Again, Pascal will touch base with, with the lab working group to, to further complete these objectives. So today, again, it's about gathering information from you about the laboratory gaps and needs and reflect on how best we can adapt this tool if you have any concerns and just to make sure that this fits all of our needs. Part of the project will include going to pilot the toolkit in four priority countries. Obviously that will depend also on engagement from the side of the countries and willingness to, to participate. So we'll be looking forward to having those discussions with you. That's for the quick overview of these two key activities. 